Wonderful. Well, I think we'll get started. Um, welcome everyone to the Berkman Klein Center and our Institute for Good and Social Media. Um, my name is Tony Gardner and I direct for operations for our institutes and I have the pleasure of welcoming you all and also introducing our moderator for today's event, Manon Rebel. Um, Manon is an employee fellow at the Institute for Rebooting Social Media, having graduated from MIT in 2023 with a PhD in Social and Engineering Systems and Statistics. Her research focuses on reviving democratic governance online and offline and understanding information disorders, leveraging mathematical models, statistical tools, and political philosophy theories, she investigates new ways to organize collectively and share information in order to update how we think and do democracy. Over to you, Mona. Thank you very much, Tony. And, uh, and please give your applause for our wonderful panelists that I will start by uh, introducing. So we have the pleasure to uh, be in the company of Claudia Schwalitz, who's the CEO and founder of Democracy Next. Democracy Next is um, an international nonprofit that has been building muscles and spreading practices of uh, doing better deliberation and better democracy around the world. Before this, you were at the OECD, where you also had to work on uh, deliberation and uh, surveying the practices of citizen assemblies around the world. I think you uh, you built this deliberation uh, toolbox uh, while you were at the OECD, um, and you are an author of, of uh, books uh, such as the Public Signal, uh, Why po Politics and Democracy Need to Change, and the People's Verdict, adding in from citizen voices to public decision making. Welcome, Claudia. And uh, and our co-panelist is uh, Lawrence Lessig, who um, is known for many achievements. I was reminded today that one of maybe the most uh, noted achievements is that you were the first Berkman professor uh, at Harvard before becoming the Roy Furman uh, Professor of Global Leadership. You also frequented Chicago, um, University of Chicago and Stanford. Um, your work at the intersection of law and technology had impacts in uh, realms such as intellectual property and antitrust. Um, on the democratic realm, some of your impact has involved uh, clerking for uh, Justices Richard Posner and Antonin Scalia. Um, you've also um, drafted, helped draft the 1995 Constitution of uh, Georgia, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, you also that was a secret. Yeah, Sorry. <laughs> Uh, and frame our accounts of uh, thinking of judges as translators of static texts into current contexts. Um, and I guess I could go on with uh, more achievements that I might just, uh, put here. Welcome, Larry, as well. Thank you. Um, and so I want to uh, open the floor thinking about the future of democracy, which is really the topic of today, thinking about democracy and technology. And uh, some of the work that you both uh, have been leading in, in different contexts has been thinking about democratic innovations. And it seems that when we think about democracy, maybe not in this space, but we've been thinking about it as a static institution that were built centuries ago. Um, and we don't really think about democracy as a, as a field of innovation and a field where things are actually moving, evolving at the same time as society is evolving. Um, and um, one of the democratic innovations that was envisioned in 1955 by Asimov is one you might not enjoy, but I would like to remind you of. I did, I did which is, um, if any of you know the book Franchise by Asimov, it's uh, this visionary uh, idea that, that Asimov had for democracy where you uh, had a machine, uh, the multi rack that was created based on everything that was ever created and written by humanity into a single machine that was capable of talking to humans. This is 1955 as a reaction of uh, polling becoming a new tool for statistical modeling in, in politics. Um, and Asimov story point as followed, there was this, this machine that had ingested anything, everything that was created by humanity, and at every election it would talk for three hours with a randomly, uh, sorry, not randomly, with, with a, a citizen of that the machine would choose, and update its understanding of society to choose the next candidate to the next election. Um, so I don't know if it, this is the direction of the marketing innovations in which we want to go, that was the one laid down by Asimov in 1955. Um, so I'd love to, to hear your thoughts on what do you think are the core problems of democracy that we are facing right now? And why the different approaches that you are taking in work uh, are uptaking and fighting these challenges that you've observed? Oh, yeah, shall I kick off? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I only learned about that story yesterday, actually, so I need to add that to my to my reading list. Uh, I guess the way that I've been approaching kind of what is what are the problems that we're trying to address in democracy uh, started off with actually explorations that I was doing uh, around populism a long time ago. So back in 2010, I was doing research around um, to what extent is, is people's disillusionment with politics and the system and feelings of lack of voice and, and agency driving uh, part of the populist trends that, that we're seeing. And at the time, there was a lot of focus on the economic and the cultural drivers, and those are there. It's a complex phenomenon. But from that research, I became really convinced that this is one part of the really deep drivers of a lot of the problems that we're facing today. So many people feeling a lack of agency to really influence the decisions that are affecting them and their families, and what can we be doing about this? I think that a lot of the problems that we talk about today tend to focus on a lot of the symptoms of the problems with democracy. So we zoom in on things around disinformation and polarization, um, campaign finance and so on. These are, these are symptoms of problems <coughs> that are actually much deeper. Um, when we look into a whole bunch of different statistics um, around uh, people's sense of uh, feeling like they matter, having real connections with other people and uh, a sense of being influenced things, those have gone down over time. Um, and I think that are, they're deeply linked to a lot of the problems that we have today, which are showing up in all sorts of ways. And if we don't kind of go back to those deep roots of the problem of how can we give more people a real sense of agency and dignity, we're not going to address the problems of, of democracy. So I, I certainly agree with that, and I feel like I'm a student of um, Claudio's work because I think it's incredibly important to begin to build these practices of deliberation. But I think it's important to recognize um, how uh, these practices uh, are challenged with the current um, environment, uh, and what in the current environment challenges them. And I think it's hard for us to recognize just how dramatically different the media ecosystem is relative to what it was when these old people like me um, settled on our view of what the nature of democracy would be. You know, we, we've passed from an era of what um, Marcus Pryor calls broadcast democracy, where we're all watching the same show. And of course, we react differently because some of us are conservative and some are liberal, but we're reacting to the same set of facts. Uh, now, I don't mean to say that they were complete facts or unbiased facts or it was a golden age of anything. That's not the claim. Just, the claim is just simply that living in a world where we're all reacting to the same set of facts and that the business model of media then was simply to tell us a story, a kind of a Walter Cronkite-like story. Um, um, and that was extremely um, productive in helping society move through really difficult problems. Um, civil rights in the 1960s, Vietnam in the 1960s, Nixon in the 60s and 70s, um, the environmental uh, movement, all of these uh, uh, really extraordinary accomplishments were made possible by, in some sense, us all being part of the same uh, conversation. Now, what's changed is not just that technology enables us to tune into different conversations. It's that the business model of technology profits from us tuning into radically different conversations. And it just so happens, too bad for us, that the best way for the business model of engagement to work is to trigger us with the most extreme and hate-filled and uh, ignorant type of content. Um, so, you know, we, we're suffering the byproduct of a business model crafted to drive advertising revenue. Now, you know, at some stage, I hope history will look back and say, wow, you destroyed democracy because you were trying to maximize advertising revenue. But that's kind of the way I think about it. Like, we've built a model for maximizing the revenue for advertisers. And the byproduct of that is destruction to democratic practices. Just like you know, oil companies had a business model for producing oil, and for many years they hadn't a clue, and then they did have a clue and they lied about it, but 
It didn't have a clue that it was going to destroy the environment, but then all of a sudden it turns out it's going to destroy the environment. You know, it's just too bad for the environment. This is the way we make money. Um, and that's what's going on in social media. And so the question is, what can we do about it? Well, I would say let's ban advertising. Okay, but that's not going to happen. Um, what we need to do is to begin to build human resilience against this reality. And I think that's about moving democratic politics into a protected sphere, into a place where it's not vulnerable to that same kind of manipulation. And I think the magic that Democracy Next is demonstrating, um, the magic in people sitting down and talking to each other about hard issues when they're you know, not people who agree with each other about hard issues, people talking about hard issues, demonstrates there's a certain thing that we humans can do when we do politics at that scale. And I think an essential part of what we need to do is to revive a sense that we're entitled to democracy. The most scary statistic in this field for me is Pew in 1998 started asking, do you have, con asking Americans, do you have confidence in America's political judgment? And in 1998, two thirds of Americans said, yes, we have confidence in America's political judgment. Now, two thirds say, no, we don't have confidence in America's political judgment. And in part, that's because we just see crazies all over the place. And you're like, wow, these are our citizens. These people vote. I mean, who would have confidence in a system driven by these crazies? Now, of course, these crazies are not representative. They're just the crazies that get us going and get the focus and constant attention to the screen. So it's not, it's not that we, in fact, are crazy, but to the extent we continue to believe that we are filled with people who don't understand anything, it weakens a commitment to democracy. So we've got to compensate. We've got to exercise the muscle that recommits us to the idea that there's a dignity in um, uh, human practice of democracy, and that dignity comes not through flashy ads or digital connection in some way. It really is just humans learning how to work out problems together. Um, I, I think that's the practice we have to revive. So Asimov was a brilliant writer, but it's a nightmare because that has nothing to do with the practice of democracy. Like figuring out the answer is not it. I don't care what the answer is. I care that people are working out an answer together. And they have that experience, and they can walk away thinking, OK, that guy's a conservative Republican, but he's not a reptile. I mean, he's like a normal person who has a kid and just wants his kids to do well. And that's the interaction that we have to facilitate through these. And I, you know, I, I've become convinced that the, that the work that, um, that you're doing, that Deb's doing, the work that is being done in the field of, of pushing deliberation and the work that um, is wonderful to see Sam Shireman, who's um, now joined us to do the deliberations project here at the a ASML. Um, uh, uh, these are all efforts to like build that practice into our life. Again, I don't know, not enough of a historian to say whether it's again, but it's certainly what we absolutely need. Something you have to give Asimov in this novel is that his solution scales very well. You don't need to have. That's right. Uh, <laughs> the, he solved the problem of scale. How do you how do you solve the problem of scale and deliberation? How do you have um, an impact that is actually impacting an entire citizenry? That especially at times where we they are deemed extremely divided. How do you scale this process? And how do you cre recreate these deliberation practices? Sometimes in absence of phone calls. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think. Well, maybe just to take a tiny step back a little bit too, because we've mentioned deliberation and citizens' assemblies, but I think maybe just for the sake of everyone being on the same page, is what are we talking about um, by this? And then how do we scale those ideas? Um, so to me, I mean, citizens' assemblies actually revive a very, very ancient practice that we've lost. Uh, we kind of forget that in the um, you know in the American Constitution, French Constitution, and otherwise, the word democracy doesn't even appear anywhere. Uh, and that was intentional at the time. But actually, when we go back to some of the historical roots of, of democracy in ancient Greece, uh, the institutions that were considered democratic were the ones where, on the one hand, there was mass participation, but the other ones were where there was this practice called sortition, meaning randomly selecting decision makers and then rotating the randomness. 
Um, and we've had a revival of this practice contemporarily in citizens' assemblies that have now been taken off for the past 40, 50 years or so, where um, you know, perhaps to define it through, through, a, through an example. So where I live in France, uh, there was very recently the French Citizens' Assembly on end of life. Uh, so the French government convened uh, an assembly where there were 185 people that were selected by sortition to be broadly representative of the diversity of French society. And they were tasked with coming up with propositions to the question of, should France change its existing legislation on end of life issues? And if so, how? Uh, so to be able to answer this, they met for 27 days of deliberation over the course of four months they heard from over 60 experts, and experts in a very, very large sense of the term. They heard from uh, faith group leaders and philosophers and people with lifelong illnesses. And then they did the hard work of listening to each other, taking in what they did. I mean, deliberation means collectively weighing evidence, but also coming to a shared decision off the back of it. So they came up with 67 concrete recommendations for how the legislation should change. Uh, and just to give a sense of the depth, that's in a 176 page report that these people wrote in their own words. Um, so a, a, real, a real kind of weighty deliberative process. Uh, and those recommendations were, were passed on to, well, President Macron met with them, but they were passed on then to the parliament uh, to be worked in the parliamentary committee. And that has now been put in the form of a draft bill. And, uh, and President Macron met with the assembly members again just last week uh, to, to have another exchange actually about, well, this is what has made it in the legislation and also ask and having a conversation about kind of the next steps and other things that, that are going on. So this is just one example out of, out of hundreds that have taken place. Um, so the work that you referenced that I did at the OECD previously um, was a, a really big study looking at, at the time, around 300 examples of these assemblies, but now there's over 700 examples in the OECD database of, of citizens' assemblies that have taken place all over the world on all sorts of, of different issues at different levels of government as well. I gave an example from, from the national level, but there's also been a ton that has happened in cities around planning issues, big infrastructure projects. Um, you know, examples from Ireland have come up around, um, uh, like Ireland has had four constitutional referendums leading to constitutional change around abortion, same-sex marriage, divorce and blasphemy off the back of these assemblies. So there's just been such a wide range of, of examples, but to now connect it to your question of scale, so sorry for the slightly long intro, but I think that context matters, is that, I mean, in a one way, we've seen a lot of these examples over the course of, of the past decades. On the other hand, 700 or so examples over four decades is not a lot either. And so there's been a bit of a limit to doing things in a very one-off, ad hoc way that really depends on political will in a moment in time. But what we're seeing more recently is an approach to trying to institutionalize, to actually build new institutions that have a legal basis, that are connected in to our parliaments, to public administration, have a relationship with civil society and other stakeholders as well, and play a really ongoing role kind of expanding our democratic architecture. And the way that I envision scale is actually building new institutions in every city, in every country, at all these levels of government so that we have no shortage of policy issues on which we can be convening these citizens assemblies in an ongoing way. So the city of Paris since 2021 has now had a permanent citizens assembly that has a legal basis. People are selected, 100 people for a one year mandate and then a year later there's 100 new people selected again and they're dealing with other policy issues. And to me, that's a vision of getting to another kind of democracy, making this a normal practice. Um, and just maybe the last thing I'll say is, I, I think because we've had this notion for so long that democracy equals elections and voting, it's a very limiting notion actually of what is democracy. And for me, part of the mission is expanding in a wide set of people that actually deliberation and having practices of sortition and rotation of that responsibility and privilege of being in the decision-making position and also of representing others in a way is also something that we can be infusing into all sorts of other organizations in our daily lives like our universities and schools and workplaces and museums so um, I think that's the other way that scale of another kind of democracy comes into being when that becomes more normal too.
Yeah, I think that the point about elections is was for me a, a kickoff point for thinking about this. There's a wonderful book by David von Raybrook called Against Elections, and he begins by saying, we have about 3,000 years of history with democracy and only about 250 years of history with elections. And when elections were born, um, the greatest philosophers, Montesquieu back to Aristotle, remarked that systems that embrace elections tend toward aristocracy, and systems that embrace sortition or decision by lot, as Montesquieu spoke about it, tend towards democracy. Um, now, the French and the Americans who launched the great democratic experiments um, quickly covered all that stuff up. Um, and part of, you know, the, the, von Raybrook makes this into a kind of almost conspiratorial story, but it's, I think it's much more practical. Like if you think if you're launching the United States in 1789, it takes four months to get information from one side of the nation to the other. Uh, how do you run a democracy? Um, with those technical constraints. Uh, and, so, and so the idea of um, running the nation through something other than the hope that they would have enlightened leaders, kind of aristocracy of ability, um, seemed kind of hard for them. And so they embraced the idea of an aristocracy of leaders through elections. And within five years, they realized it was a terrible mistake. It was a totally disastrous idea. The House of Representatives was not filled with Madisons or Hamiltons or people like that. It quickly became, you know, a cesspool in many ways. Um, and you know, that's that is even better than the clown show that it is right now. So, so I think that the, what's motivating about that story, I think, is to realize there's a lot of space for innovation. There's a lot of uh, ways that we can begin to think of remaking democracy because this particular version is so recent and so narrow. Um, and, and the part that I think is, is, has potential in the United States that's really under recognized is that indeed the United States Constitution itself embeds a sortition structure into our government. Um, you know, there's this, all this talk about sovereign immunity in the United States. I don't mean presidential immunity, I mean sovereign immunity. So the, pre the federal government has sovereign immunity which means you can't sue the federal government unless the federal government says you can sue me. And states have sovereign immunity, which means you can't sue the states for money damages unless the states say, yes, you can sue me. Neither of those immunities are in the Constitution explicitly. They've all been interpreted as implicit in the structure of the federal government. The immunity that is explicitly in the Constitution is for we the people. The Constitution effectively says we the people cannot be arrested and prosecuted unless we the people say it's okay. That's called a grand jury. And it says you can't be convicted unless we the people give you up and say you're going to be convicted. That's a petit jury. So the jury is constitutionally embedded and the jury is a random rotation system for making really important governmental decisions. Now it's a terrible citizen assembly because it's too small. It's not, there's no guarantee of representativeness and blah, blah, blah. But the point is the tradition of rotation and randomness is part of our tradition. We just have to revive and recognize it. And I'm still tracking this source down because it, when I read it, it wasn't important to me, but now it's really important to me. The beginning of the 19th century in Philadelphia, the class of people who could be jurors, namely people like me, like white male property owners, the cl that class, on average, served on three juries a year. So you kind of think of a world where three times a year you are given government power and you're asked to make a really significant decision. That would radically change your, your conception of your role to the government. And, and I think this is, this is at the center of what this movement is trying to revive, the notion that we are all part of the gover government. We are all part of governing ourselves. It's not just politicians who we elect and then complain about. It's all of us. And we need to have a regular way to enable that to happen. Um, and we're going to have to experiment with lots of strategies and technologies and approaches um, to make it happen. Because the, the biggest challenge we face right now if, in the reality of the way government is funded is cost. Um, even though it's not 
Uh, so here's a particular example. I went to um, I went to uh, Cuba. Something I've always wanted to do. And what's bizarre about Cuba is, uh, you know, we've had an embargo against Cuba for 65 years. It's the longest blockade of a country in the history of humanity. No country has blockaded another country for this length of time. And you're like, why? Why are we doing it? And of course, you know, 78% of Americans would have no clue that we're even doing it. Um, and most would be like, what, what would the reason be? I don't see why we're doing it. And, and of course, Obama tried to re relax it. And then Obama, then uh, Trump, as a gift to Marco Rubio, revived it. And then Joe Biden didn't reverse it because the Florida Democrats said, please, we're trying to get one more seat in Florida. And we think we can persuade the Cubans to support us. Um, Joe Biden's administration blocked the import of equipment necessary to fix an oxygen plant in the middle of COVID. So we literally suffocated people in the name of this embargo. Okay. So I kept on digging, like, what makes, why is this true? Why is this still here? It turns out the United States government sends $50 million a year giving money to Cubans in Florida for the purpose of spreading propaganda against the Cuban government in Cuba. $50 million a year to run a campaign against the, quote, communists in Cuba. And of course, the Florida Cubans are extremely important to the balance of power in Florida. So you're like, we are subsidizing the Florida Cubans remaining anti-Cuban normalization so that they can continue to get this you know, pot, pot of money every year, this gold every year. To, to continue to run whatever they're doing, you know, their websites or their Twitter feeds or whatever they're doing like this. So, okay, so that's the problem. You say, what if we had a citizen assembly to address the question, should we normalize relations with Cuba? So I'm completely convinced that that citizen assembly would determine overwhelmingly, yes, obviously, there's no reason to continue to, to force this suffering on the Cuban people. That would cost to do it in the best possible Jim Fishkin-like way, million dollars. You know, that's a high number. So for a million dollars, we would end $50 million of subsidies to uh, propagandists in Cuba. So it seems to me that pays. But the standard way in which people confront this is they see, my gosh, you're going to have a deliberative poll, it's going to cost $300,000, or a citizen assembly, it's going to cost seven hundred thousand. That just seems like too much money. Um, I don't think it is, but I do think we need to start thinking about, are there other techniques that could lower the institutionalized cost? Like, do we know what juries cost? No, we don't. Because they've been embedded, they've been baked into the institutions of the courts. They're just part of the system of the courts. Um, and I think that if we could bake it into the institution, we could make this cost more normal. We could experiment with other techniques. So, um, you know, MIT is experimenting with for a project, which is an extremely important effort to try to um, make this more accessible and uh, make a, a deliberation-like process more accessible. We've, again, my second um, advertisement for Sam back here, but we've just recruited Sam to come stand up a deliberation project on a platform that we've just acquired that we're going to open source to enable lots of this deliberation um, uh, to develop. Um, but I think it's just a moment of experimenting to revive a tradition that is part of our history. Yeah, and can I just pick up on the cost point because I hear this so much in the field that at a local level, a citizen's assembly will often cost somewhere between 150 to 250,000 dollars or euros, you know, but people are coming together again for a lengthy period of time to grapple with the real complexity of an issue. This is nothing like a focus group or the kind of traditional town hall meeting or surveys or things that are that are done. The, the French assembly was around, I think, 5 million, actually, the last one. But again, oh, wow. 27 days of deliberation with 185 people. And, and this was all in person. And so, but at the same time, when you think about, I don't remember what the figure was, something like 16 billion? going around the, the investment into, I, I don't think we should even use the word investment, but how much is being spent on all the election campaigns in this moment in time? It's just crazy. Like, let's think about how many citizens assemblies we could be addressing, <laughs> using to address. And, and I don't think, 
I mean, I'm kind of um, wary about trying to lower as much as possible the cost of assemblies and of deliberation because it's more expensive than a focus group. I think actually we should be investing in the infrastructure we need to support this. Part of what's expensive is we're doing it all over again each time when it's a one-off. So the more we're actually also investing in that democratic civic infrastructure that supports this, so that within the administration, you actually have a team who knows how to run sortition, that there's a team that knows how to design and run these assemblies that's at arm's length. So what we've seen actually happening in Ireland so far now, it's been over a decade that they've been doing assemblies at the national level, where it's become more normalized. And so there's a whole team in the administration, there's a secretariat that's independent and separate. They've built the kind of, capacity also within the administration and nobody is now questioning the value or, or the, the attribution of this after after a decade you have ministers fighting with each other for their issue to be the next one for the next assembly there's an election coming up and um the question isn't about is there going to be another assembly it's what will it be about because depending on who wins each party has different priorities for the first topic <coughs> so that to me is like how we do how do we get to that being normal actually um, and that this marriage what's, investment what's hopeful about that is um i think the first time the french parliament this idea was suggested to the french parliament probably a dozen years ago or something like this and what it was suggested every party signed a a resolution that said that this would be a complete violation of the idea of representative democracy. They are all totally against it. And now in France too, you have candidates running saying that if we win, this is the citizen assembly vote. So a decade or 12 years is a short period of time, and there's a lot of progress possible. Yeah. I want to play the devil's advocate just for a second. Um, the I'm sure that when the founding fathers of this country uh, or founders of different democracies around the world were designing institutions and constitutions and elections, they didn't have in mind how elections get to fail and how elections get to become oxidized uh, based on how we actually behave in the context of elections. And uh, sometimes I'm afraid that when we think about democratic innovations, we tend to compare a normative ideal of how a system would, would play out with uh, the reality of a system that to some extent has failed and was brought to fail because of the way in which we've interacted with the institutions. And I think similar points could be made with technology. We, uh, if we have time to talk about how technology can enhance these processes, we also know how we can get to use the technology in a way that uh, is counterproductive. So, so what are the failure modes of citizen assemblies and deliberations? What are the things that could happen that are not dissimilar to what has happened in the elections? And how do we know that we're not comparing apples and oranges when we're looking at what's happening now and how a system evolved over, over 200 years? versus a new idea that has been experimented in places where decisions are not binding and so don't suffer from the same pressure from the outside. Um, and if you have thoughts on, again, failure modes, how to avoid them, and why do you think, in the presence of failure modes, this would seem to be a better equilibrium? Yeah, um, I think it's a fair question, and it's something that we should think about, and especially in a context where, I mean, I also personally think that we need to be moving to a next phase of experimentation where there's actual decision-making authority that sits with citizens' assemblies when they're convened as well, and exploring what does that mean for legitimacy, for accountability, for that just wider relationship with the other uh, institutions of, of government as well. These are not unanswerable questions, but we haven't, as an academic community or practitioner community, really been thinking about them seriously. Um, I think we're starting to see in the countries where uh, there has been at least a wider prominence in the sense of, of media coverage, wider citizen awareness. Like in the French ex uh, example that I mentioned, what was interesting to see was that um, the deliberations were all taking place at the at the building of the French, um, uh, it's called the Social and Economic Council. It's kind of like a third chamber of civil society in the, in the French system. And so that's right beside uh, a metro stop where most of the, like all the assembly members were arriving there. And uh, various organizations started taking out advertising in that metro station on issues related to, you know, why there should be more investment in palliative care and other things like this. So it's, it's a sign, actually, that they're starting to have more influence and power, but that when that's the case, there's always going to be people who will try to be gaming the system in some way. So I'm not naive about that either. I think there's more, um, how do I say, like, um, 
kind of protections built in around corruption and uh, protecting fairness into a system where, you know, if you're selected into an assembly by sortition, you can't be re-elected. You have no incentive to be re-elected. You have no incentive related to your political party and allegiance to it, to climbing up within it, to, um, you know, and, and because also the other thing I didn't say uh, earlier too is there's usually a super high threshold of consensus required in these assemblies for a recommendation to become a recommendation of the group. So it's often somewhere between 70 to 80 percent. Uh, in the French assembly, it was actually 92 percent in the end of life one um, that people voted uh, for the recommendation. So again, if you're meeting such a high level of threshold of, of percentage, you're not looking for that 51 percent and just the one or two extra people you might need to try to win over if you're a lobbyist. Um, and we saw with the previous French citizens assembly on climate change, there were a few lobbyists that tried to, outside of the kind of formal process, approach some of the assembly members to try and convince them of various things. But those assembly members called them out to the organizers and to the media. <laughs> so I think there's a different set of incentives that also gets ignited in us. So sorry. as citizens, when we're convened for something that's really about the public good, uh, and we don't actually have very many occasions when that's the case. And I don't know, maybe this is like my very positive side, but I believe in the humanity of people and the goodness of people overall. And we need to try and create and think about that, the design conditions that help bring out that constructive side in all of us as much as, as possible, while thinking and trying to mitigate for what will inevitably be some attempts to nonetheless gain gain the system, which I have no doubts there would be people that would try that as well. I do think that there's more robustness built into, into such a system though. I guess what I'm worried about is um, people believing that it's all just a sham or a show. Like it's just greenwashing. And like this has been a complaint in some context where the government has stood up these processes that the government themselves craft, and then the government is not really bound by what it does. And um, so that's one part of the problem. And the other part of the problem is, though I believe in America, this has a very strong roots, people will approach it and feel very weird about it. They won't. If you say, this random collection of 400 people is going to decide whether X is law or not, people will be, whoa, 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 like, who are these people? Um, uh, and, and so I think that in America, the strategy that I re would recommend is first, um, we go slowly. Second, we find salient issues that capture people's imagination. But third, we're very careful that those issues don't trigger organized opposition. So for example, um, if you look at the Irish abortion Citizen Assembly. It's really extraordinary. It's it's really rich. And the final report is not black or white. It's not pro-abortion or anti-abortion. It's a very subtle um, perspective on like when end of life decision, when um, uh, uh, termination decisions are appropriate. And blah blah blah. Um, and so I was working with a woman in Texas who said we ought to do one of these in Texas because she said, and I think she's right the result in Texas would look very much like the result in Ireland. Uh, and it would be much more sensible and balanced than the Texas legislature. So I'm absolutely convinced that's true. And uh, I would love that to be part of the debate about um, um, uh, the, uh, the right to choose uh, uh, for women in America. That, you know, I obviously come to this with a strong presumption in favor of that right. But I would be terrified about that being a uh, citizen assembly for the citizen assembly movement, because if that were a citizen assembly, and that did come out with a liberal view on abortion, then the pro-life movement would identify citizen assemblies as the enemy. And so you would trigger an organized interest group to start taking on the enterprise of citizen assemblies. So, I have kind of, it's kind of like John Marshall, Chief Justice Marshall, the beginning of the Supreme Court, like we tell this story to our students and then fail them if they don't repeat it back to us, that, um, that Marshall was a very careful architect of 
the jurisprudence of the court in part to build the institution of the court. And he was very careful to make sure he didn't make decisions that would undermine the capacity of the court or undermine confidence that the court was in fact an independent institution. That's, I think, kind of the intuition we need to deploy here, that we pick issues and deploy issues that capture people's imagination, but don't trigger a kind of a tsunami response from people who are who lose because of a particular outcome. Can I just probe you on, on that a second, though? Because I mean, I'm, I'm curious why you think that, because I, in, in a way in Ireland as well, it was a hot button issue that the MPs did not want to touch for decades. Um, and there is a strong pro-life movement there as well. And yet having a process that lasted for five months where there were also certain rules in place, like if you um, were already a member of an organization campaigning on either side of the issue, you couldn't be an assembly member. But what you could do is you could present your evidence. And they received, like I think, 13,000 submissions of evidence from all sorts of people and had a process around how people can engage with that. There were 100,000 people that watched the live streams from that assembly. So it also kind of, beyond it filtering out into a wider public because those assembly members also brought that to the to the dinner table with them there were also lots of other people that were kind of it enabled them to have conversations around an issue that otherwise it was just hard to even talk about with people and i mean i am aware that i feel like in the us things are kind of maybe ultra polarized or divided around I think it's more things, fundamental but point. i but i'm curious like why you think it would be so different here yeah so so fundamental point is we couldn't have a national citizen assembly that would have any binding legal authority. And you couldn't have a national referendum that followed from a national citizen assembly that would have any binding legal authority because of our constitution. Right. So, so you can only be doing it on the state level. And I'd be completely convinced that you would do it in Texas, it would be very much like it was in Ireland. You know, let's say it took the same amount of time, same number of Texans watching it, same number of but the point is that it would only be for Texas, even if they like made it law, which of course would be a big assumption, but even if they committed to making it law, it would only be for Texas. And it would be just the first shot in a national fight that we see breaking out right now about you know, local laws being passed one way or the other. So I'm just, I'm just reporting a feature, a bug, in the current political reality around this issue in America. Um, not because I think we would be less capable of engaging in exactly the way the Irish did. It's just that in the politics of it, it would, it would just be one shot. One Do you see any potential at the national level? Yes. Something? Well, I, I think <coughs> you're not going to get, without constitutional reform, an ability to have um, a national decision that's ratified through a referendum. At the national level, you could imagine Congress, like, you know, writing books this is part of like the recommendation so imagine congress created a citizen assembly process and um you know it said the president can bring two citizen assemblies during his or her term and congress can recommend a citizen assembly uh, every two years um uh, and maybe there's a citizen initiative process for citizens to create a citizen assembly and congress could commit that any proposal coming out of the assembly would have fast track status in Congress in the sense that it would be introduced and passed through the congressional process in a fast track way, meaning it has a clear path to make sure that it gets a vote in both houses. Um, but it would still require Congress to commit to it. Um, now, there could be this transition stage. So in America, we didn't have election of senators um, uh, until the 17th Amendment. Um, and before the 17th Amendment, you had many states who effectively created the popular election of senators by saying the state legislature would commit that it will do whatever is the result of a popular election in the state. So they would run a popular election, and Joe Schmo would win, and then the legislature would select Joe Schmo to be the senator. So that was an indirect way to create um, effective popular control. You can imagine a similar thing to this, you know, if you said Congress will respect the results of a citizen assembly, and then if Congress, some congressperson votes against it, you're like, you know, don't you support people, but 
you know, the scale of the United States, it's hard to see the same kind of political pressure. Are there any for questions on the floor? I will ask one last to the panelists, but uh, we are ready to get them just after this one. Um, I just want to touch base on one uh, term in the title of this conversation that we didn't really talk about, which was this conversation was about democracy and technology. And it seems that we've talked a lot about how we take democracy back into offline spaces a lot and how we get people to talk again with one another. Uh, though I know that for both of you, this idea of bringing technology within this process is something that is quite important to you. So we already said that the Asimov multi-bag idea is out. This is not how we use uh, technology and democracy. Is it for you something that can actually enhance the systems? We know that also technology ends up in the current forms of the technologies we've been using. These are social technologies and we co-evolve with them. And so how is this taken into account into the visions that you have for the future of democracy? Mm. Well, first of all, I'm just really glad about the order of this conversation because I think it's nice that we started with, well, what problem are we actually <laughs> solving? What do we think about democracy? And then where does technology actually come in to enhance those democratic innovations that we believe in, which I have to say is not always the logic of these conversations when you're talking about democracy and technology as well. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I have been working on citizens assemblies, deliberation and the human in, in person uh, uh, aspect of this for a long time. And I still believe that that is the starting point and, and the heart of all of it. But um, the, the technology aspect should be coming in. So uh, at Democracy Next, we are collaborating with the um, MIT Center for Constructive Communication and, and Dev and Dimitri are here and having just wider conversations also with others in, in the field about these, these questions too. Like, Larry and yourself and, and others, but uh, but with MIT we're working on trying to bring in um, technology that will help enhance the in-person process. So for me the goal is not to be trying to actually get rid of that or to speed it up or to make it more efficient. You know, if we go back to the problems we're solving, those are not the problems. <laughs> the problem is we're not actually meeting each other enough in person, taking enough time to have conversations, to listen to one another, so people actually are heard and have a voice and that we're dealing with the real complexity of the issues that we face. So I don't think we need to kind of touch any of those aspects, but we have been doing this work in a very analog way in the field for a long time. And I think we can be thinking about technology in terms of kind of the both before, during and after. So before, how could we be leveraging something like the Fora platform to be used and the whole process that sits around it for wider community listening and bringing in the voices of a much wider set of the community as part of an evidence base to the assembly. So it's not just the experts uh, and the stakeholders, but actually community voices are also a core part of that. We can also be using uh, recordings during an assembly process to help with the sense making. So one of the kind of key dynamics that takes place is, you know, you have 185 people, but you're going back and forth all the time between small group conversations and large group conversations again. So there's also something sometimes a little bit lost in the richness of what happens in all those small groups that having technology help with the recording, with the summaries, with the sense making that happens that we could also be, be leveraging. And then I think for me, uh, another part of it, and well, I should say for us, because we've been talking about this collaboratively, is also about how do we have a better public archive of what has happened? So we do have public archives of what happens in our in Congress and in our parliaments around the world, but a lot of what happens in these assemblies is a little bit of a black box still in some ways. So the plenaries are being recorded more and more. So like I said, in Ireland, it was live streamed and that's more common practice. Um, but we get little snippets of it and all we really get from uh, at, as the wider public is the PDF report at the end of this. So how do we actually have a public archive that's much better grounded in the voice of people? Um, and I think maybe just the, the other thing I really want to emphasize is that because there is a wider uh, debate going on in, in the field, and I'm curious also what you think about this theory too, but I, I feel like there's kind of two philosophies, and it's linked to the question around scaling as well, about, well, you know, technology could enable us to have deliberations with a million people at once. Um, and some of the arguments around that kind of come from certain aspects, which link up to the cost conversation we had. Well, 
facilitators are expensive, but we could be testing things like AI facilitation. So, you know, colleagues at Stanford, Jim Fishkin and others are doing things like this. Um, but again, to me, that kind of if we go back to, well, what problems are we trying to, to solve? And we want more people to have agency and we want more people to be strengthening their civic muscles. And actually, to me, the role of a facilitator is crucial. And more people, I think, need to have those kinds of facilitation skills. So actually, how could we be training more people to have those facilitation skills rather than thinking about, well, we could be using AI to facilitate? Maybe possible, but my, my question is like, is that desirable and is that going back to the problem that we're interested in, in solving? Um, and so I really believe that for me, there's a sense of technology enhancing and assisting various things in person. Um, but I'm pretty firmly on the side of believing that there's lots of questions we should be posing about, uh, like, if it's possible, do we want to do that um, around uh, certain things like this? So it's kind of where I, I fit in on, on those questions. So I feel like I have a, a, distinctive, a distinct view from that. Um, I don't feel like it's either or. I think it's both and. Um, so I want the world to build exactly what you're describing in a much more robust way every year. I think it should be a part of governance, should be a part of the ordinary rotation of citizenship. Absolutely. And to the extent technology can help make that in-person experience better, I'm all for it. But I think there's also, in addition to that activity, the possibility that um, technology can enable deliberation in other contexts um, that could have not the same consequence, not the same experience, but something very similar to it. Um, and if we could radically increase the number of contexts where people are engaging in something that feels like real deliberation, that would be a good thing. If only to train them, to make them more comfortable with that activity when they are finally summoned into the kind of real space type of deliberation that you're describing. So I think deliberation needs to be a part of every single educational, every single high school. It needs to be part of how, how how businesses like work out problems on uh, you know with with each other, and um, I, and so I, I think you know part of our effort or experiment here is if we can drive down the barriers to enabling healthy deliberation like that in a virtual way, um, it wouldn't be because that's where we should be doing citizen assemblies. No, I think we should be doing citizen assemblies in real space with real people talking um, to each other. But you know, can we can we discover where we actually have disagreements in virtual space, and then begin to map the places of disagreement for governance into citizen assemblies? Um, could we to use tools like Polis or the whole suite of AI technologies to begin to um, map the kind of implicit mind of a community, like to figure out where we actually agree and where we disagree, um, as a way to facilitate better places for deliberation. I think all of these experiments are great, um, as long as nobody kind of takes a dominating view that says this is the only kind of deliberation or um, only kind of um, assembly that we should be I mean, I agree with a lot of those aspects too, and it's not an either or and all of it. Like we're also exploring actually, could we integrate Polis or something similar, like the work that Ariel Prokacha has been doing on generative social choice? Could that be connected or other things? So, you know, there is a wider exploration, and, and we actually had a pretty natural experiment during COVID in some ways, with yes. a lot of assemblies yeah. taking place on, on Zoom and, and so on. But we also learned from that that it was neither cheaper nor easier uh, and, and posed a whole other set of problems that don't happen in the in-person ones too. And, and sometimes I find, and, and you're not saying this, but I have found in other conversations that there's this assumption that, well, making things uh, virtual will make it more efficient and cheaper and easier. And I think we need to be realistic that actually if we're still really committed to a lot of the democratic principles, um, then it's none of those things. But that's fine because it does enable other um, possibilities like at a global level yes. and, and other things like that too. So I don't think we actually disagree no. too much on, on, on that. Maybe my main question though, sorry, I'm kind of taking over sometimes, but just to probe on what you think on the AI facilitation question. I think it's an, it's an open question. I mean, I think we should try it, and we should see what it's, what's good about it, what's bad about it. Um, and uh, and so I, I love what Jim's doing in Stanford, and I would love to see if we could begin to evaluate. Mm -hmm.
for us. More going for questions. Yes. My understanding, and you should please correct me if I've got the facts wrong, is that in Ireland over the last year, there was a Citizens Assembly that recommended some constitutional changes. All the major parties supported the changes. They went to the referendum. People voted no. Uh, that suggests that maybe something didn't quite go as smoothly as it should have. Can you say more about that? Yeah, so, so um, this is um, it's a fair question. It's a more complex situation to explain, which is why I didn't go into that example. So that was the uh, fifth and sixth constitutional referendums that have taken place in Ireland since. I think um, the first time that kind of that happened. But and that's still. again the, the first four passed yeah. and all resulted in constitutional yeah. change. But this was also the only time where. Uh, there were a few different factors. One was there was a really big time gap between when the assembly made its recommendations and when the referendum took place. Uh, the other difference was that this was the only time where the government didn't take up the actual um, specific recommendations for the wording of the referendum question and they changed it and they m both kind of watered it down and made it more ambiguous. And a lot of the debate, uh, the public debate, and what was written in the media around it showed that actually those were the main reasons why people voted against it. That they actually would have preferred for the citizens' assemblies okay. more. Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, the, 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 the citizens' assemblies' recommendations that went a little bit further than what the government did. So there's a certain complexity in, in all of this as well. And actually, the prime minister resigned after uh, after that referendum took place. So. Um, so yeah, there's a few different lessons we could be learning from that whole okay. experience. Um, we're fast approaching time, so we might uh, lump a couple of questions together. One from our online audience is, uh, what strategic shift in philanthropy's approach to pro-democracy funding do you believe is most needed to facilitate progress for this work? And then I think there's another question in the room you can add on. Uh, Professor, as Professor Rari uh, suggested, uh, when the U.S. Constitution was drafted, it talks uh, a few months to gather people's opinion across the nation. Uh, so it, it may be a reason of introduction of representative democracy to the U.S. Constitution. So, you know, uh, representative democracy uh, takes time and cost. Uh, however, uh, taking the time in representative de democracy uh, have made uh, 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 deliberation possible. Uh, however, today on the internet, especially on social media, everything uh, changes so rapidly. People's sentiment and opinion uh, uh, moves so fast. Uh, uh, under such circumstances, uh, deliberation would be very difficult. Uh, so, uh, as Claudia suggested, uh, uh, developing uh, citizens as assembly is a good idea for promotion of deliberation. Uh, but uh, today, many people are so busy in, in their business and uh, private life. So, my question is, uh, how can you ensure enough time for uh, deliberation in a time of rapid development of digital technology and business? Let me take the first one here because I want to start in answering the question of philanthropy. So one great idea would be to give Democracy Next tons of money <laughs> to help. Um, I, I to did do not it. ask him to say yeah, that. But, but, I, but, I, but I think both of us agree that a critical stage of, of resource support would be to build institutions that could radically lower the cost of running these citizen assemblies across, especially the United States. If there were kind of an administration, I mean, the government would be ideal, but it's not going to happen, but an administration that had expertise, um, maybe had democracy fellows that could go help, you know, a citizen run, a, a city run a citizen assembly, could do the, like take Ariel Kasha's um, a formula for figuring out how do you create the right representative sample. All of that institutional work um, needs money, and we don't have that money right now. Um, as to your uh, really important question, I think that um, one thing it's hard for us today to like under to accept, but would have been obvious to them 240 years ago to accept, is that we don't we shouldn't expect that all of us at any time should have something to say about every issue that there is, right? Um, there's kind of a presumption of modern democracy that. Like we're supposed to know everything. Like we're supposed to know what policies, you know, we vote for a candidate for president because 
that candidate agrees with our, pol our views on trade and on minimum wage and on climate change. And, and that's kind of presuming we actually have a view about trade and climate change. And, and the reality is, as you say, we have lives. Most of us you know, spend most of our time dealing with our lives and our kids. And, and uh, we have very little time for thinking about these other types of things. And, and I think like 240 years ago, it would have been more obvious that, that never, you wouldn't expect us to all be ready to give an answer to everything at any time. And the idea of rotation is not that we are experts on everything at any particular time, it's that we're called to be experts about one thing at one time. And I think if we could get to a world where three times a year we were called into some decision and we made it and it had a consequence, we could see in the world what the consequence was, that would be magic. That's the elixir of democracy. Like if we really felt, and not just white male property owners, right? all of us felt we were part of government decisions and those things, we don't have to agree with them, it's just that we're part of them. And we have a chance to understand them and make a decision on the basis of it. That, that's the practice that I think we need to do. Another question in the room? Thank you. So, so I feel it's very interesting that you talk about the revive the tradition or revive people's sense of they're entitled um, to democracy. So I wonder, like, there are a lot of countries in the world, and in some country, maybe people think they do not have this tradition. So do you think that people have to be trained to be ready for democracy? And in that sense, when you talk about the idea of um, citizens' assembly and picking topic, for citizens' assembly, I feel. Do you think that's a sort of training? And like in my country, I, I feel that every topic you choose, like in China, could trigger trigger the government's um, sentiment or something. So in that sense, um, do you have an idea that how to how to try to train people <laughs> to be ready in under those circumstances? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think yeah, it's really interesting question to think about because well I think in, in a few ways like one is that it's actually been kind of interesting to be able to have more open conversations about ideas like these uh, with people in China because you're not talking about elections <laughs> and, and actually the idea of sortition and deliberation feels somehow a bit less um, I don't know yes. it, it, it's just possible to have another conversation around this and I think this idea of people needing to be trained to be ready I feel like actually we kind of need to awaken these skills and capacities and abilities in people in kind of everywhere. Like I think even in this country and in the country where I live and in many other places, most people have just never had these kinds of experiences as well. And so how can we be expanding that opportunity? And that's where that idea of also in schools and universities and workplaces and these ideas being infused all over the place, not just you know, waiting for that one national citizens assembly in government is what is also really, really a big part of, of the vision here and what we need to be doing too. In China, not so much recently, but um, but before the real dominance of Xi, um, there was a lot of experimenting with uh, with uh, deliberative polling. Jim Fishman was doing a lot of deliberative polling in China, and it was precisely because it was local governments realizing this is a way they could figure out what people wanted without there being an election. So there was no political threat. Um, and now, you know, Westerners are always cynical about whether the government actually does what the people want. I, I don't have any way of evaluating that. But I do think the practice taps into something very natural. I think actually humans, the, the process of growing up, well, before this generation, that, grows up on screens, but the process of growing up without screens and like learning to work with people and play with each other is all you need to be able to engage in these processes. It's just about learning to talk and listen and negotiate with each other and small groups that citizens assemblies require. And that's what humans have done for the whole of the history of humanity. Um, another question from our uh, audience online, but also want to remind folks we have some food and refreshments outside so we can continue these conversations uh, after the formal close of the event. Um, but a couple about uh, citizen, citizen assemblies uh, in the local context, specifically asking about the US, um, the best mechanisms to uh, institutionalize and integrate these voter processes at the local level in city governments. 
I'm just sort of that question very broadly. Yeah, I mean, well, the, in a way, the local level cities have been leading the way in this movement. So 65% of the examples of the 733 assemblies that have taken place so far have been at the local level around the world, which makes sense. There's way more cities than there are countries, so I think we'll always have that kind of proportion and, and so on. Um, and what's been interesting in the conversations that I've been having in the US, and I'm curious also what, what you're thinking about this too, is I think there's a lot of interest and, and openness. I think that many people haven't heard as much about some of these stories that I think just kind of more naturally by proximity have been spreading and inspiring others in Europe um, over the past few decades. So I really believe there's actually a hunger and an interest, um, especially in a climate where people feel like there's division and polarization and, and that these are also ways of trying to bring people together by doing work together around issues that matter to them um, as well. So I mean, we're, we're going to be working with cities here in the US over the next um, next year or so um, and, and and I feel like where there's also some opportunity is taking some of the learnings from these four decades of work that have taken place and kind of being able to go a little bit more immediately to this place of talking about building new institutions. I think there's something that makes a lot of sense about how doing this once with one group of 50 people, yes, it'll be amazing for those 50 people and you'll, it'll be great for that policy decision. But if you're also thinking about the bigger picture of democracy and how do we innovate it, how do we address these deeper roots of giving more people more agency, then the, the idea of building an institution where you're creating an opportunity for the rotation of members to bring in people over time, I find has also been really resonating. And that's really exciting to me too, that there's a, a willingness to think about it in that longer term way and think about the investment that that requires and some of the supporting civic infrastructure that sits around it as well. So Yeah, I, I think I, I was involved in one conversation with one unnamed city. Um, and what I was worried about at the end of the conversation is that they, they were picking boring questions mm -hmm. from the Citizen Assembly. The kind of question they don't even want to have to deal with. <laughs> like, it's just too boring and technical. And, like, um, and I think that would be a disaster. <coughs> I think, again, this is about issue selection is critical. They need to select issues that make the citizens feel like they are the important people in the room. You know, so questions about um, you know, how do you finance local campaigns? That's an important question. Um, and if the citizens felt like they were helping them make that decision, that would lend um, gravitas to their processes. But if they're trying to figure out what the permitting process should be for local restaurants having evening, you know, dinner, dinner on, the, on, on the sidewalk, it's like, don't we hire you for that? Isn't that the sort of thing a government should be doing? Um, isn't that a bureaucratic decision? So, I think part of this has got to be pushing people into something more than just citizen assemblies as cheap bureaucracies, and instead citizen assemblies as uh, um, you know, having their own dignity in the democratic process that reflects what's special about the way they're constituted and, mm -hmm. uh, and the work they do. And there's no shortage of like real issues at the yes, city level, course. like around the housing crisis everywhere. And actually what's interesting in the US compared to other countries is that there's usually a fair amount of real power that sits at the city level too. Yes. So that makes it even more interesting to be experimenting there first. I, I really feel like that's the biggest potential in the US as a, as a starting point for this movement. Well, I just want to thank our online audience for the, the lively uh, chat contributions and questions. We'll be sure to pass these on to our panelists, but I want to throw it back to Manon for any sort of closing remarks. I know we're a little bit past time. Thank you so much for the questions and for your time and thoughts on these issues. I just, uh, I wish we can, I hope we can continue this conversation over great food, just uh, at the other side, on the other side of this room. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.